Um, good afternoon, everyone. How is the day going? Lovely, lovely. Um, so as, as, I, as I was just introduced, I work for Thomson Reuters, and I actually work in the legal division doing business sales and business operations. So don't worry, I'm not going to talk about law or anything like that. Um, Thomson Reuters is a really interesting organization. It was first created in 1799, um, and it's now at the leading edge of technological change and technological development and continues to do so. Um, I've had a 14-year career there. And one of the reasons I was asked to talk is my career's I suppose, spanned a real change in the emphasis of the organization, away from print to digital and now into software and workflow. So I kind of hope in talking about that, I'll be able to give you some insights into the modern organization. Um, I also want to go beyond that and talk about the fact that human mind and intelligence is still vital in organizations. You know, forgive me on a technological day, but technology is only part of it. It's the application of your knowledge that makes you vital in the modern organization. So I want to talk about that, and I'm also going to touch on what the digital workplace is and what's your place in it. Does that sound okay? I've got a few nods. Excellent, excellent. So we'll crack on. Um, I sort of briefly went through this already, but this is the structure. So a little bit of history about Thomson Reuters, where it's come from, where it's been, where it's going. Um, the digital workplace. Um, what are the challenges that this means? And either you're in, or you will shortly be in. And then finally, the bottom one, the digital skills required. How can you respond to that? Um, I'm going to talk about the modern knowledge worker. Um, I don't know if that's a phrase you've come across a lot. Is that sort of news to you? Good. Thank you for shaking your head at the back. Um, I'll talk about what that is and what the modern knowledge worker's place in the world is is. Um, just to touch on that, the modern knowledge worker is often talked about as the defining resource in organizational success. By that, it's their ability to manipulate information and data for positive organizational outcomes that is the defining difference between a successful and an unsuccessful organization. Um, can that be done without technology? Not nowadays. So the modern knowledge worker needs to embrace and learn and understand what that is. So if I move on, the history of Thomson Reuters, obviously there's a pigeon involved, obviously there's a cup of coffee involved. I, I'm a, obviously you know why. No? No? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so the cup of coffee, that relates to our founding fathers of Stephen Sweet and Alexander Maxwell who met in a coffee shop in Chancery Lane in 1799 and realized that with the improvements in printing technology and the efficiencies that were happening at the time, they could now print legal treaties and legal information in a cost-effective package, a book that could derive money to them. First reason, the first use of technology in our organization. Um, Interestingly, the first title they published was called Woodfall Landlord and Tenant. It's deathly dull, don't read it. But it was first published in a book, then it went to loose leaf, then it went to CD, then it went to online, and now it's fully immersed into our workflow software and solutions. And this is one of the themes that I'm going to be talking about. It's the content and the information is still valuable, whatever the delivery mechanism. Does that kind of resonate with... Your, your understanding of how I'm going to talk about technology. Um, pigeon. Now, interestingly, I'm going to talk about the pigeon as a piece of technology. So just go with me on this one. Um, in 1851, Paul Julius Reuter set up the UK to Europe news agency. And at the time before this, most people were using couriers so men, and it was men at the time, on horseback, sailing backwards and forth, crossing the rivers, crossing the, the English Channel to get the information. It took days, weeks even. He used homing pigeons to start to beat that, to start to use natural technology, but technology nonetheless, to gain a competitive advantage. 
Very quickly, in 1861, the telegraph came, and Reuter, again, was positioned to exploit that technology. Um, 1861 really defined his reputation because he was the first to break the news of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln to the UK and Europe, and he did that by using modern technology. Finally, the big data Wordle cloud. I love Wordle, it's amazing. Um, and what am I talking about with this? Well, it's the complexity of data, and it's how we manipulate that data and manipulate that information to be able to provide the right answers at the right time. Um, I'm probably laboring the point a little bit here, but you can kind of see the change in technology. And, you know, books, yes, we've talked about, the modern world and the always-on position of modern data. But this is a kind of in-between. Obviously, it looks like a computer, but it was a dedicated terminal that sat in libraries that you had to book time on, both with your organization and us, in order to access the information. It was about as far from always on in cloud computing as possible. But it was part of the gestation of technology. And I always just find that very interesting to see how technology develops. Interestingly, um, I think the ethos still remains the same. Our raison d'etre is the provision of information, whatever the technology. Um, this is our future. And it's a lot more complicated. And it's a lot more complicated because technology is more complicated. We have to embrace and absorb a lot of different potential streams of technology. We're doing a huge amount of work in the artificial intelligence space, both in the financial business orientated side and the legal side. We're doing a huge amount of work in blockchain. And that's not just about your standard Bitcoin work. This is contractual work. Does this have a future in the law? Um, big data, the cloud, and cognitive computing. But again, it's all about the provision of information using the quickest, most efficient technology. Um, this is our kind of mission statement. And whilst it may just sound like a trite marketing piece, I think people who are really passionate about Thomson Reuters feel this and live with it. And it's got three prongs to it. It's the use of intelligence. It's the use of technology and its expertise. And we bring those together to provide those trusted answers that professionals, whether you're an accountant, a lawyer, a banker, whatever you may need, we provide it for you. And that's where we live. And that's why I kind of see the technology so fully integrated into our world. But that's a history lesson. Is it kind of interesting? Not as many nods this time. Fine, fine. Um, so I'm going to move on to my second point, and the, the modern digital workplace. Um, I thought the maze was a really good image for this, because a lot of people, and even people who work within the modern digital workplace, can find it a real challenge to navigate. It's changing so much that what you know today is not what you need to know tomorrow. And you have to be prepared to, I hesitate to say, go down dead ends, but at least explore options and be aware of all the options. Um, but then I thought, you know, what, what do we mean by the modern workplace? And I talked to the senior leadership team in my organization, and we had a good chat about this. And I thought this was quite a good picture of the challenges of the modern workplace. And the uncertainty and complexity was really highlighted by the diversity of challenges we face. You know, I think it used to be in organizations, you faced one challenge, you overcame it. But now the challenges come constantly. And a lot of that is because of the globalization nature of business. Different business systems, different ethoses, different cultural norms, um, systems and structures continually changing. You know, it, it's very tough for an organization to hold on to that and to create a competitive advantage. But one of the ways they do it is through efficiency and speed. They get things right the first time. Um, you need to be able to identify those fleeting opportunities. And you know, if you can do that, you can exploit them, you can gain competitive advantage. But you can't do that without technology. 
And you can't use the technology without good knowledge. And you can't have good knowledge without intelligent people. So it starts to become this flow of skill set that organizations need to cherish, really. Um, and that's where it comes to my second point, the technological challenges and the powers of the knowledge worker. Um, I, as you can tell, I fervently believe that one cannot exist without the other. You need the knowledge worker to exploit technology. You need technology to support the knowledge worker. You know, we talk a lot about AI being systems that work on their own, but they've got to output to somebody who's got to then do something, and somebody's got to set them up. It's a continuum. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, I did just want to mention the sort of unintended impact of technology, which can sometimes be a bit negative. Um, and a lot of the technology we use on a day-to-day -day basis is really helpful in communication and makes a lot of efficiencies. But I have a lot of people at work who never switch off. I'm getting emails from them at 10, 11, midnight, 1 a.m. sometimes. And, you know, great, they're doing work for me, brilliant. But when are you going to burn out? When are you going to turn off? And I, I make a rule that Friday night, 5 p.m., turn it off. Turn it on again, 9 a.m. Monday. And I know there's some countries, France and Denmark, there's organizations in there who are really told to do that more to get that work-life balance. And I think that's just something to consider, that technology isn't a panacea. You've got to be careful how you use it. And I think whilst there's an onus on us as individuals to recognize our needs, there's an onus on organizations to not, just because it's there, you don't need to use it. Um, there was an article in The Economist this week that was talking about the impact on your IQ by being distracted by email when you're working on a task. And they said it led to a short-term 10-point decline in your IQ just from the bing of an email on your phone. And I think that's really interesting as well. So to be effective, sometimes you've got to put technology away. Um, I'm just going to move on to oh, this. So you're too far away. You probably can't read it. Um, but it's a nice donut showing the legacy digital workplace at the center, surrounded by the modern digital workplace. And I really like this because the legacy digital workplace is probably where I spend about 90% of my time. And within that, I probably spend 90% of that time in MS Office. So your digital champion here will be very proud of me for saying that, that you need to learn these skills for an effective organization. Um, we did a study in Thomson Reuters. Now, it was with a lawyer, but they were saying on their first day at work, they're going to interact with 30 different pieces of technology, whether it be email, Excel, the phone system, whatever it may be. Um, nothing to do with their knowledge, nothing to do with their training. Just 30 pieces of technologies in order for them to be an efficient lawyer. And I'd probably posit that in any professional environment, it's going to be quite similar. So actually understanding the technology is almost a prerequisite now for you being a good employee and a good knowledge worker. So it's no longer just about what you know, it's how you communicate what you know and how you work in the environment. Um, this is a quote from the OECD quoting Berger and Frey, who are two US academics. And I really like this. Um, information technology is prevalent in all but two roles in the US, dishwashing and food service. I spent ages arguing with my partner about this, and she was like, what about fishermen? What about, st oh, what was it, dry stone waller? What about artist? You know, I, I realize that these all exist. Um, and I think the point with this is those organizations are now marginalized, they're edge organizations. If you're gonna have a normal career, you're going to be in a digital world. Um, I then kind of reflected on what you need for success in the digital world. And these were my thoughts. And in many ways, that would be the same whether you're in a digital workplace or a non-digital workplace. Core skills are still a requirement. Intelligence, adaptability, that's still a requirement. And then I thought, yes, but you can't have that. You can't be effective 
without the technology of the laptop, the always on phone, you know, it's the core skills to the knowledge worker are still the same, it's how we apply them. So this was the recruiting poster for the US Marines. I'm not asking you to join the US Marines. Um, but I do want to just sort of turn this on to you guys now. You know, I've told you how difficult it is. Well, how can we now support you to make it a success? Um, in 2015, the House of Lords said that digital skills should be taught as a third subject in, in, in addition to numeracy and literacy through school. It's almost like it's reading, writing, arithmetic, and coding. And I think the digital world is so ingrained now that this is the way it's going to go. Um, I see a lot of people join my organizations and join my teams who describe themselves as digital savvy, digital natives. Do you know what I mean by digital natives? So digital natives are people who've grown up with technology. Smartphones are just part of you, you know, people who are used to that world. I'm not. I didn't use a computer until I went to university. I had to handwrite my essays at university. They wouldn't accept computer essays. So just imagine that, that challenge that I then faced in the world where I had to learn to communicate via email, I had to learn PowerPoint, I had to learn Excel. I'm a digital immigrant, if that makes sense. So these people come into my organizations as digital natives, very switched on, very able to communicate, but they're social digital animals. All their, all their digitization is in social communication, Snapchat, etc. I didn't want to list any more because I didn't want to seem so old. I said Facebook or anything like that. Um, but what I find is they're really challenged to use work digital communication tools, PowerPoint, Excel, even email for some because they've never used it. So I'm just saying, don't assume that just because you have certain skills, they'll see you through to the next stages in your career. Um, this is actually very similar to a conversation I had with my CEO when I was talking about the need to invest in more knowledge workers and support their development. Um, I think some people see knowledge workers as a bit of a dirty word. Well, what do they do? Oh, they just push paper around and do all of that. But actually, you know, they don't manufacture something. They don't make something. But I would argue that knowledge workers do. They make decisions. So they're there to use their intelligence to make decisions. Decisions about what to sell, at what price, in what market, using what campaigns, with what logistical supports. They're the, they're the intelligence. They're the thought behind organizations. And as I said earlier, they're the key advantage an organization can have. Um, so how do you thrive in this digital world? Um, you can see what the skills needed are. You know, it's not a mystery. You know, it talks about solid literacy, solid numeracy. But the word I like is adapting. You've got to adapt to the current technology and the current organizational needs. If you do that, you'll be a success. I think one of the things we see on this in the environment of the digital skills is the fluidity of work and the fluidity of career. I think it used to be that you'd almost have a job for life. You learned a skill, you became an expert at it, you were treasured by an organization, they looked after you, gave you a job, and then you retired. That's just simply no longer the case. There's a phrase called the protean career, where you build your career from the start, and you have to be responsible for your learnings and your development. And it's an interesting juxtaposition that the knowledge worker has never been more cherished by the organization, but has never been less supported and less involved. It's, it's almost like you're a gun for hire. You can come in, give us your work, we'll pay you well, but we're not investing in you. Organizations are slowly realizing that this isn't going to work, but they're only doing that with people who continue to adapt themselves. Um, so this is quite a wordy slide, and I am sorry about that, but I did want to put it all on. If you want to read more about this, I would really point you towards this article. I think you've all got access to the slides. Um, it's a great article. It's about jobs and skills for 2030, so it's the next decade of what you need. And you can see on here 
But again, it's talking about personal responsibility. Be open to taking advantage. Change your knowledge boundaries. I'm not here to tell you what technology to become an expert in because it's gonna be different in whatever career you choose. What I am trying to do is just give you that general picture of what your core skills need to be. For me, it's intelligence and adaptability. If you're willing to learn and willing to challenge yourselves, you can create that niche in an organization, which means you're not stuck in a niche, you're developing your own niche throughout your career. Um, you know, the digital workplace has changed in all recognition, not just from 100 years ago, but 20 years ago when my career began. And I suppose I haven't really talked about how the pace of change is accelerating. Um, a digital native of 2018 will not be a digital native of 2020. There'll be so much technolog technological change in those two years. You can't rest on your laurels and assume. The people who succeed are the ones that challenge themselves to learn over and over again. And I was reading a paper that was talking about forgetting knowledge. We talk so much about gaining knowledge that we sometimes forget to forget, if that makes sense. What got you here will not get you there. And you know you have to sometimes forget. And I was thinking about this, and I'm not a coder. I'm not in that world at all. But think about all the changing coding languages that have happened. Some of it's just irrelevant now, but you needed to know it to get here. And then you need to almost forget it. Um, I do always want, want to suggest that in business, people do business with people. That is still vital. Technology can allow the communication to be more effective and more instantaneous and cross global pathways, but you still need to be able to interact with people. You still need to be able to collaborate. And down the bottom, these were the phrases I really enjoyed. Adaptability, of course, but that cognitive skills, resilience, that ability to be resourceful. If you have all of those, you will continue to be vital and valuable to the organization. So it was a bit of a whistle-stop tour through my thoughts and my, my career. I hope that proved helpful, or at least interesting, <laughs> but at least not terribly boring. Thank yeah? Thank you very much. It came up, it was actually from the, towards the beginning of your uh, presentation. Yeah. And you, took, uh, and you developed it for the knowledge worker, the modern knowledge worker. When students are looking at uh, things like information management, what's the difference between information Oh, big question. Um, I think you need to be a knowledge worker, you need information to work with, if that makes sense. Um, it's your job as a knowledge worker to manipulate that information, to make decisions based on that information. If you just have information, it just sits there. And information can be interpreted well, and it can be interpreted badly. It's the skill of the knowledge worker to be on the good side. So again, a knowledge worker, you're still rated. You, 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 in the modern world, it's not, it's not a given that you're going to be brilliant. So you need to work with it and improve. Pleasure. So well, I suppose now you're into the psychological stance uh, of are you, are you innately intelligent or can you learn? Um, I think people have baseline intelligence, um, but I think that can be negated by a failure to challenge yourself and a failure to develop and a failure to learn. And somebody who's, let's say, less intelligent than another but has got that will to learn and the will to challenge themselves could probably do better. And I think I know what you mean. Um, and I think. I do know what you mean. I think in in previous workplaces you learnt the role, and then you could just improve in the role. But 
I think now it's almost like a stack of pancakes. You've got to learn again. You've got to keep learning. Intelligence to me is how you use that knowledge. So you could have two people who know have exactly the same knowledge of a role, but if someone's a bit more intelligent, then they could probably do a better job. And it, and it sounds horrible to say, but you know, cleverer people are probably a bit better at their jobs. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, controversial yes, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for that. No, absolute pleasure. Thank you.